Well, thank you, Stephen and Star, for coming down and crossing the causeway to lead us in worship today. We appreciate uh, you guys coming down from Houston's first. I've enjoyed getting to know Stephen uh, over the past few months, and uh, he's, he's actually even helped with some good insight as we're working towards our, our search for our next worship pastor. And so um, we are still actively searching, and so continue to pray for our church during this time where we're, we're looking for God's man for that position. And so uh, be, be praying for us uh, that God would lead us to the right right person. But uh, in the meantime, we're so grateful for friends like you guys uh, who can come in and step in and lead us. So thank you so much. Well, I am not uh, the first preacher in my family. Um, my great-grandmother um, is from, was from De Quincey, Louisiana. Anybody know where De Quincey is? Uh, it's in the suburbs of Lake Charles. Um, it's a little small town uh, outside of Lake Charles. And um, she originally, her name was Ada Green, and then she married um, the very first Panel Sanders. I'm actually, that's my first name, by the way, is Panel, like, like on the wall, like, <laughs> like, or of judges, like Panel is my first name. So I'm the fourth panel. So the very first panel was a guy named Panel Ethan, and he married Ada Green in De Quincey, Louisiana. Now, when they got married, it was, it was a bit of a scandal because the Sanders were a little shady, uh, just, just being honest. Like their, their reputation in town was not the best. And the Green family was an ultra, ultra conservative sort of family. In fact, my parents have discovered uh, letters written by the Green family to my great-grandmother when they started dating, complaining about and really warning her that you are marrying into the Sanders family. And, and I, I, I want to give you a direct quote. Uh, in one of the letters, her sister says, you have been Sanders-sized. <laughs> so now we use that in our family. Uh, you've been Sanders-sized. Well, anyway, so um, Ada Green had a brother named Clarence Green. And Clarence was a King James-only Baptist preacher. He was the kind of guy that had a microphone hooked up to his van and would drive around town proclaiming the gospel. And his version of the gospel was, didn't sound so much like good news. It actually sounded like bad news. Because his version of the gospel was, hey, you heathens, you need to repent. You De Quincey heathens, you've been Sandersized. You need to repent of your sin. And I, I, think, about, I think about that approach to religion, and, and all of us have, have probably encountered some of those types of people in our lives, particularly here in Galveston. If you're ever here in Galveston during Mardi Gras, um, there, there's typically some guys hanging out on a, on a street corner, you know, just yelling at the heathens at Mardi Gras. And, and I think... I don't know that that's the way Jesus would approach it. I don't know that he would. Because actually, when you think about it, Jesus saved his harshest criticism, not for people who were outside the church, but for people who were inside the church. Jesus directed his harshest criticism towards religious people. And, and there's part of us that when we hear that, we go, yeah, Jesus, you get them. You get those hypocrites, right? Like you get those people who just pretend to be Christians, but they're not really that, that Christian. They're really judgmental sort of people. Man, you, you tell them, Jesus. You tell those Pharisees. You tell those, those legalists. But the problem is, is that no one ever wants to see themselves as a religious legalist. Like, no one wants to see that in ourselves. It's, it's actually one of those things that's actually pretty easy to see in someone else's life. Like, we can see their hypocrisy. But when it starts to focus on us, when we think about our own hypocrisy and our own blind spots, then it makes us uncomfortable. And so I just want to give you fair warning today that if you are a church person, I'm going to step on your toes. You shouldn't have worn flip-flops, right? Hey, you, this is a steel-toed boots kind of day. But, but we're going to take a hard look at 
this interaction that Jesus had with some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because even though it was 2,000 years ago, I actually think that the interaction has tremendous value for us as we understand what it means to follow Jesus, what does it mean to live like Jesus, and to, to love the people around us. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 11. Um, that's the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And uh, if you don't have a copy of the scripture, we'd love to give you one. You can stop by the, the resource table after the service is over and pick one up, or you can follow along on the screens or on your phone. But we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 11 today. And, and by the time we get to Luke 11, I mean, Jesus is really in the heart of his ministry. Uh, he's well known, he's established. To the point where he, he's not like trying to introduce himself. He, he's more actually in this phase where he's, he's actually defending himself. Because the, the religious leaders of the day um, had already decided that they didn't like him. They already decided that they didn't like what he stood for or his approach to ministry. And so there, there was always these com, kind of combative interactions. And we're going to read about one of those today. So here we are, Luke chapter 11, verse 37. It says this, it says, as he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. Now, when the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed that he did not perform the ritual washing before dinner. Now, we've talked about these guys before. The Pharisees were like the religious uh, keepers of the rules. I mean, if there was anybody who valued the religious rules, it was the Pharisees. And they, they made their living. Literally, like they, their reputation was built on the idea that we're the ones who keep the rules and we have self-appointed ourselves to be the ones who make sure you keep the rules too. And so this Pharisee invites Jesus over and then he's shocked that Jesus doesn't fully engage in the ritual hand washing. Now this is a pretty interesting thing um, because um, the Old Testament gives us Lots of prescriptions for how an Old Testament Jew was supposed to follow, terry, follow the dietary laws and expectations. I mean, there, there's actually a ton of that. If you read the book of Leviticus, and some of you have ever tried like one of those Bible reading plans, and you started in Genesis, and by the time you got to Leviticus, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it, you know? <laughs> but in Leviticus, there, there are all these different rules and regulations for how people were supposed to remain clean and pure. And, and those were actually given to us by God. Like, God expected his people to do those things. And Jesus, we know from Scripture, always kept the law 100%. There's not a, a time that he ever broke the law. And think about it, he's the one who gave the law. Like, he's the one who invented them. He, he's the one who gave those rules. So Jesus never breaks them. But what he does is he breaks the rabbi's interpretation of the law. Because you had the law, but then the rabbis did something called building a fence around the Torah. It was the idea that, that, that they wanted to make sure that you didn't come even close to breaking the law. And so they would create these extra things that you needed to do just to make sure that you didn't break the law. And so the issue for Jesus is, is not that he sinned. It's that he, he violated the Pharisees' expectation for what that, that law was supposed to be. And the truth is, is, is here in America today, we, we do that all the time when it comes to Christianity. We confuse our own personal convictions for biblical commands. I'd say probably I think the most prominent example of that would be when it comes to alcohol. Like it, it is normal for, for a Christian to develop a personal conviction about their relationship with alcohol. But it's, it's actually wrong to take that personal conviction and then apply it to someone else. Like you, you may come to the conclusion that, hey, it's not helpful for me to drink, it's, it's not a good thing for me to do, and so I'm going to choose to abstain from alcohol. But the moment you cross over into judging someone else for having a margarita at, at salsas, then we, we've actually stepped across a line where we're now judging someone not based on what Scripture has to say, but on our own personal convictions and standards. And that's what the Pharisees did. Like, it wasn't just about, hey, are you keeping the law, but are you keeping the rabbi's interpretations of the law? Are you, are you buying into this religious system 
that we've created. So it causes quite the stir. You can imagine. Jesus, Jesus shows up. He doesn't follow their rules. And it says, verse 39, it says, But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and evil. He said, Fools, didn't he who made the outside make the inside too? But give from what is within to the poor, and then everything is clean for you. In other words, um, he says, listen, you are so focused in on ritual hand washing that you are missing the heart of what it means to love God and love people. Like your main concern is, did I go through the right steps before dinner so that I would be quote unquote holy in your eyes? But Jesus says, you're missing the, the heartbeat of faith, which is to care for the poor, to care for those who, who need help, to care for those who are on the outside. Like, you're majoring on the minors. Like, your, your focus is on these little nitty-ditty greetails that, that aren't even, quite frankly, in Scripture. But you're missing the heart of what God has commanded for his people. I love what this pastor named Mike McKinley says about the Pharisees. He says, the Pharisees obsessed over the external aspects of religious life that could be observed by others, but gave little heed to the more unseen and internal aspects of godliness. On the outside, they gave every impression of being righteous, but on the inside, they were full of greed and wickedness. Guys, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is so, so important for us. God is not impressed by religious rituals when our hearts are far from him. God is not impressed when you go through the motions because he knows the difference. He knows the difference when you participate in the Lord's Supper or communion and it's a genuine act of authentic gratitude for what Jesus did for us on the cross. He knows that when we partake in the Lord's Supper with the right heart, that that it's actually a form of worship, that we would confess our sins and express our need for God's grace and thank him for what he did for us on the cross. Like He knows the difference between when we authentically participate and when we're just going through the motions. He knows the difference between when we come to church on Sunday morning and we sing a song and and it's just words. Like our, our mind is, is on a million other things. And when it's a moment where our heart is expressing a deep need for Jesus. He knows the difference. God is not impressed by religious ritual. And it doesn't matter what the religious ritual is. He cares about your heart. And so you can do the right things. But if your heart is not in the right place, then it means nothing to God. Like, in, in, in fact, you're only fooling yourselves. Because we can, we can trick ourselves into thinking because we do these things, then God is pleased with us. Uh, and we can actually fool other people too. We can fool our family. We can fool our friends. We can fool our fellow church members into thinking that, hey, listen, if I'm, I'm faithful in my church attendance or I'm faithful in my giving or I'm faithful in volunteering or I'm, I'm faithful in leading out in the community or sharing my faith, if I, if I do all these things, then surely that means that my heart is in the right place. But God says, no, and I can see past all that. I see all that. I want your heart. I want the real thing. So verse 42 says, but woe to you, Pharisees. It says, you give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and love for God. These things you have done without, these things you should have done without neglecting the others. Now here, what Jesus is, is actually affirming is that, hey, listen, it is a good thing to be generous. He's actually affirming their tithe. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, it was wrong for you to tithe. He's saying, actually, that's, that's a good thing. Like, you being generous is good. And, and to be clear, guys, part of the Christian life is coming to the conclusion that, listen, everything that we own is really God's, and we're just stewards of it. And, and part of what he wants us to do with this stuff is to be generous, to meet needs, to help other people. And so 
the fact that the Pharisees were really, really good at tithing is, is not the problem. In fact, they were so good that they would calculate even to the smallest like percentage to make sure that they tithed. Like they, if, if grandma sent them $2 for birthday, they'd give 20 cents. Right? Like they, they wanted to make sure that they, they tied exactly what I was supposed to do. But Jesus says, look, you can do that, but you're missing the heartbeat again. Like you're missing the, this heart that, that actually I've commanded you to use that generosity to help others. And so what ends up happening is it actually becomes this, this deal where religious people twist God's commands into checklists. Religious people twist God's commands, his good and gracious standards for us, and they turn them into like checklist Christianity. Um, I'm just kind of curious, just a show of hands, how many of you guys uh, grew up attending church? I mean, a lot of you in the room, some of you didn't, uh, and that's, that's fine. Like we've got people of all different sort of backgrounds. Uh, I grew up attending church, and I think one of my memories from the, my early days of church was actually uh, being in big church and getting to give my offering for one of the first times. Like, I, I remember my parents talking to me about that. Uh, and, and back in the day, this is before Venmo and Cash App and all that stuff. Um, you couldn't give online. You actually had to give, like, actual, like, currency. And uh, we would put our currency in an offering envelope. That's where it would go. Uh, I'll show you a picture of one. Uh, this is just one I found on the internet. Y'all remember stuff like this? Any of you guys? Some of you are like, no, no, I don't actually. I'm 17. I don't remember it. No. Um, so, so back in the day, you would, you would turn in your offering, but not only would you have to mark um, your offering, but you would, you would actually check all the religious tasks that you did. And you had to make sure, did I bring my Bible? Yep, I, I did. Did uh, I go to Sunday school? I did. Did I study my lesson? I'm like, yeah, yeah, sh- sure. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and listen, I don't know who designed these to begin with, you know, 150 years ago. They, they probably actually had good intentions. It was probably a way of uh, holding people accountable or helping people understand what was important and spiritual disciplines. And it was probably a way of, of like... Maybe they were kind of, uh, kind of numbers-oriented people, and they said, man, we're going we're gonna to make like a little chart and spreadsheet, and we're going to calculate just to see if our folks are, are actually doing this, right? It, it probably had great intentions when they, they first designed this. But the shadow effect of it is that there's a whole generation of American Christians who think that if I do these things, then God will be pleased with me. Like, if, if I check all these boxes then God will be pleased. And so the, the heartbeat of religion, and, and we've talked about this earlier in the year, it doesn't even matter what religion it is. The heartbeat of religion is if I do these things, God will be pleased with me. Like if I obey these steps, if I participate in these rituals, if I do these things, God will forgive my sins and he will be pleased with me. But if I don't do these things, he's going to be angry with me or he'll be disappointed <laughs> With me. So the Pharisees created this expectation that what it meant to be a good follower of God, to, to be a God fearing, God honoring person, was to do the right things. And their focus was not on the heart, it wasn't on the motivation behind why you did what you did. Their focus was on behavior and behavior control, and behavior modification. And so if you did these right things, then you would have right standing before God. But here's the deal. The gospel tells us that none of us are capable of doing the right things all the time. In fact, even in our best efforts to try to do the right thing all the time, we fail miserably and completely. So the only way... We have right standing before God is not based on anything that we can do. It's actually trusting in what Jesus did on our behalf. Like that's the heartbeat of Christianity. That's the heartbeat of the gospel. It's to say, listen, um, there are all these rules, but the truth is 
man, I can turn in my offering every week and I'm still not going to somehow be able to balance out the sin in my life. Man, I can read my Bible. I can pray. I can come to church. Man, I can get here early. I can volunteer for the parking team. I can volunteer with the two-year-olds. None of those things will somehow wipe out my sin. It's only by the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for us. Like it, that's where our faith comes from. That's the heartbeat of Christianity. But the Pharisees didn't get it. Like, it, I mean, it was so deeply ingrained in them that it really infuriated them that Jesus took this approach. Hey, they, they, they really felt like, hey, it's all about what you do. It's all about the religious checklist. And so here's what Jesus says to them. This is really condemning. Verse 43, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees. You love the front seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Now, when we hear the word Pharisee, um, if you've been in church for a little while, you understand that that's typically not a compliment. If someone calls you a Pharisee, you're like, hey, bro, what's up, man? Like, like that's not a compliment. No one wants to be called a Pharisee. But 2,000 years ago, to be a Pharisee was a compliment. 2,000 years ago, to be a Pharisee was a position of high esteem. Like, that, little Jewish moms would, when they dreamt about, hey, what is my kid going to be when they grow up, they thought, man, wouldn't it be awesome if our kid was a Pharisee? Like, that'd be so good. Like, that's, that's what it was like to be a Pharisee. It was a position of honor. And they got front row seats. They got VIP service. Like, they're the ones in the community that everyone looks up to. And he says, woe to you because you care about your status. And the, the, the note part this morning is something I want you to write down is religious people make ministry positions into an idol. That's, that's the modern day parallel is that we get to a place where we like the status that comes from being recognized as a religious leader. And quite frankly, it doesn't really matter what the title is. We just like titles. We like titles. I learned that in college ministry. I used to be a college pastor, and I found that um, if I wanted college students to do something, I'd give them a title. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's, that sounds important. I'll sign up for that. <laughs> but you know what? We don't ever grow out of it. Like we, we like the prestige that comes with the title. Like we don't want to just serve in anonymity. We don't want to serve in such a way that we don't get credit. We want to serve in such a way that, that people recognize our contribution. We want to serve in such a way that people know like, hey man, you are killing it out there. Man, you are making a difference. And, and the danger of that is that we really fall into two categories. One is, is that we start to wrestle with pride. The moment you step into a, any sort of ministry leadership position, man, you are going to, to be dealt with this temptation to be prideful. That you, you, you pat yourself on the bat, back for the difference that you're making. And then that pride actually leads to self-protection. Because you are in a position where people are looking up to you, your temptation is to cover up your sin and to cover up any weaknesses you might have because if people only knew that you weren't perfect, then, then maybe they wouldn't let you lead anymore. And so what happens for ministry leaders, and this is for pastors and missionaries and elders and deacons and small group leaders and uh, any other ministry that you can think of, is that there, there's this pressure internally to present yourself publicly as someone who's got their act together and who doesn't struggle with sin and who actually is just, man, they're just running hard after Jesus. And you, you can't admit it, right? Like, you can't admit when, when life gets hard or, or when you stumble and you fall and you need God's grace. And as, as much as we can here at Coastal, I want to create the culture where the bar for leadership is not perfection. Because if the bar for leadership is perfection, none of us get to lead. Like, none of us get to serve. We want to create a, a, a culture where we recognize that, yes, holiness, holiness matters. Yes, integrity matters. Credibility matters. But it's also, man, we're just a bunch of sinners who God has chosen to use in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our weaknesses. And so if, there, if there's no grace for, for others, 
then, man, we're actually just fooling ourselves. And we're creating a false sort of culture. And so we, we, we value that here. And, and so if, as you think about, hey, I've been coming to Coastal for a while, and I'd like to get involved, I'd like to maybe serve in ministry here, but you're like, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I just, I got some stuff in my past that I'm ashamed of, or maybe I'm still very much a work in progress, and I'm, I'm trying to figure some stuff out, and I, I just don't feel like I'm there. Um, hey, give us a shot. Give us a shot. Don't say your, your no for yourself. Like, uh, allow us to come alongside you and walk with you on that journey and just figure out what that looks like. But the Pharisees valued that ministry position over anything else. Verse 44, Jesus comes back and says, Woe to you, which, by the way, is not a compliment. <laughs> when Jesus says, Woe to you, whatever follows it is not going to be good. Like, woe to you. I may start using that at home with my kids. <laughs> woe to you who have not taken out the trash on Tuesdays. It is your one responsibility at our house, and you could not even get it done. Woe to you. Sorry, that hit home. That hit a little personal. Woe to you. You are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't even know it. Now, that's a, the reference to this damage that legalistic um, attitudes can have in our hearts is that we think that because we're following the rules that God's pleased with us. In verse 45, he says, one of the experts of the law answered him and says, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. Then he said, woe also to you, expert in the law. And he's just giving out woes. Like he's just, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he says, woe also to you, experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, and yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. And I think one of the most frustrating things that we've all experienced is when religious people give themselves a pass when they break the same rules they expect everyone else to follow. When leaders give themselves a pass, hey, it's okay for me to do this, but it's not okay for you to do that. He says, that's you. That's what religious people do. And I tell you what, we, we see this in government life, right? Remember the pandemic? This is this thing, 2020, COVID. Y'all remember that? Uh, remember the stories of the various governors and political leaders who would stand up on stage and say, hey, stay home, save lives, like make sure you wear your mask. And then you find out that immediately after they left the stage, they went over to their house and had a party. You know that, that hypocrisy that that creates, right? That tension that that creates. You say, what? You, you say that I'm not supposed to travel to go see my family at Thanksgiving, but you traveled to see your th family at Thanksgiving. Like, that's, that doesn't seem fair. And that's part of the, the Pharisee attitude is to say, hey, look, I can bend the rules, man. I can compromise because I'm mature, right? I've got some wisdom. I've got some perspective. Or, or maybe because I've earned my dues. Like I've, I've paid my dues. I've been around for a while. But you people, you guys need to make sure that you follow the rules. I can make exceptions for myself. We won't talk about that. But you guys, you need to follow the rules. Listen, that, that is so destructive, and, and you can imagine 2,000 years ago kind of the culture that had been created in this religious world where people were probably just exhausted by the rabbinical expectations of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were constantly saying, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. And yet, there's a whole group of people who their hearts were far from God. And... They didn't follow the rules themselves. And they didn't pay attention to the stuff that, that really matters to the heart of God. And that was true 2,000 years ago, but it's also true today, isn't it? Like, the damage that can be done when we find ourselves as, as kind of accidental Pharisees, when we find ourselves, like, buying into this. And the truth is, I, like, I wish, I wish I could preach this message and be like, yeah, man, those other people at those other churches, 
they should hear this. Because no one at Coastal struggles with that. But the truth is, all of us do, right? Like on some level, all of us fall into these same temptations. And so here's how I want to land. I want to ask you to, to kind of process this message not like, hey, does someone else in my life need to hear this message? But like, man, what does this look like for me? And that first thing is for you to just simply check your heart. One of the things that, that God tells us in his word is, is um, that we can ask God to search our heart, and he does. Like, that's the cool thing about the Holy Spirit is that uh, when we open ourselves up to the Spirit, like doing some diagnostic work in us, um, the Spirit will do that. And so check your heart. And then as you, you think about ways that you've fallen into this, we simply confess and repent. And that's, that's, the, that's the pattern. We own it. We, we admit that we have these tendencies. And then repentance is a big churchy word, but it simply means to turn around. And it means that you actually stop doing it. And we don't just own it and say, yeah, I'm legalistic. And then I'm going to keep being legalistic. But we repent and say, you know what? I need God to change my attitude towards some stuff. Like I, I, I just need to confess that. But at the end of the day, we have to rely on God's grace. We rely, rely completely on Jesus. And, and that's the difference between the gospel and religion. That's the difference between cr- true Christianity and churchianity. Churchianity says, hey, listen, uh, just keep coming to church. Keep trying your best to be a really good person. Christianity says, I know I'm not a good person. I know I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. And I hope you get to that place today where you're just honest enough to say, you know what, man, I need Jesus. So here's here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time in prayer, and I want you to have that moment just with God. Um, We do have a great prayer team, and so after the service is over, uh, if you want to pray with them, they'd love to talk to you about uh, what that looks like for you to wrestle with this stuff, or, or even if you have questions uh, of what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And, and maybe you're here today, and, and you don't come from a church background, and uh, you've experienced some of these things almost maybe secondhand as you've interacted with Christians, um, but you have questions about what does it look like to actually follow Jesus? I thought it was just about coming to church. Listen, we'd love to explain what that looks like in your life. But for everyone else, I just want to give us some space, just you and God. And would you do that? Would you ask God to search your heart this morning? To point out any times where you know, you've fallen into some of these traps we talked about today. And then as, as the Spirit brings that up, will you just confess that to Him? Repent. Say, God... So often I I find myself worrying about what other people are doing or what other people think. Or maybe sometimes I actually just focus on the wrong things. I miss miss your heart. Would you confess that? Repent? Then as you confess and repent, will you just declare to Jesus in prayer that you need his grace. You need his forgiveness. That none of this stuff, none of this churchianity, none of this religious rituals, none of the things that we think make us have right standing before God, none of it could possibly achieve that. It's only by God's grace. So will you just beg him for grace? And if you've already received his grace, will you just, in a heart of gratitude, express your thanksgiving for the grace that covers you? even when you fall into your accidental Pharisee mode. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful um, just for the text this morning and and for the way that you you love people, even Pharisees. God, I'm I'm grateful for for the times where I fall into some of these traps personally, and yet um, you still love me, and you still forgive me, and I'm grateful for that grace in my life, and um, God, I pray that as we go about our week this week, that uh, you would help us remember uh, this message today. Give us a heart that reflects your heart for for people. Give us a spirit of humility, 
and grace towards others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.